This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Life can be very difficult at times. As listeners of this podcast, you may know that life's problems can often feel insurmountable, and it's not uncommon to feel alone and at odds with yourself. However, you don't have to handle life's twists and turns alone. BetterHelp Online Therapy is there for you. They will assess your needs and recommend a licensed professional therapist specializing in your specific care needs within 48 hours hours. I live in New York City, which is the epicenter of therapy, and I've seen it work wonders for many of my friends and colleagues. But even in a big city, it can be difficult to get an appointment with a therapist, sometimes taking weeks or even months. BetterHelp is always accessible. You're never left with outrageous waiting periods. If your therapist isn't the right fit, you can easily switch. BetterHelp is not a crisis hotline. It's not self-help. It's professional online therapy that is secure and available worldwide. BetterHelp is a great way to invest in yourself, and they have a special offer for my listeners. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash Nick Bryant. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash Nick Bryant. Paper reports that two of the male prostitutes were given a late night tour of the White House last year. My name is Nick Bryant, and welcome to the Nick Bryant Podcast. Today, my guest is Jackie Bynum. She's a producer. How are you doing today, Jackie? I'm doing very good today. I really am. It's I'm above ground, as they say. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's part of the battle. Some people would say it's 85 to 90 percent of the battle. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, Jackie? Well, I... If, if, to boil it down to the lowest common denominator, I am a journalist by trade. Uh, and then I got into uh, television where things are a little different than the print version, but I've been in radio and now I'm in television. I do investigative report uh, series. These are usually four to six part documentary series that investigate a certain killer or a murder or some sort of aspect like that. I mostly deal in true crime and that there's a lot of things that cover <laughs> you can cover in true crime, but mostly serial killers. And in the last few years, not by choice, just by what I fell into, I, I fell into the world of predators that are pedophiles. And uh, it, around our office, you know, once you, I don't know about you, but sometimes you get so into a project, you forget that other people don't know what you know. And you say things quite flippantly and you have to remember, you're talking about horrible things, but other people in the office are a little surprised by it. But I've become sort of the, uh, people go to me and say, oh, you know about pedoph pedophiles, Jack. And I go, well, I don't really know personally, but I, I have covered them. <laughs> I do know something about them. I feel that same way exactly. Uh writing the Franklin scandal. I, um, you're thrust into a dark parallel universe. And uh, I, remember, I was watching a documentary on Richard Feynman, the famous physicist. And when he was in Los Alamos, he would take furloughs in San Francisco. And he'd see people putting buildings up and engaged in their normal life. And he'd say, don't put that building. He knew what they were building in Los Alamos could potentially end the world. And he was almost telling these construction workers not to put the building up because it's going to come down anyway. And I had a similar fatalism with the Franklin scandal, where I thought this is our, our government is so corrupt. Um, it, 
some dark malignant corner of its intelligence is is pandering children and blackmailing people. And I, I just thought that the country was en route to spiritual death. And and when you're in that headspace, you're, you're very different from John Q. Citizen. He's thinking of something completely different. Yeah, you really are. Because once you get into it, you start to question things that you innocently believed in. You know, we trust in institutions. I mean, I did. The policeman is my friend. Uh, all our government, our institutions, we, we want to trust them because that's what that's our goalposts. And then when you find corruption within it, it kind of is a house of cards where you start questioning everything. And before the internet, the, amou the amount of corruption, I think, was 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 there and it was hidden up much better because because you could you there's so much you didn't know about and now we know more about it but even I don't know if that's any better because now you're worried about everything but there is a lot of corruption and it's been going on for a long time and I always boil it down to two things you know money and power can make a lot of things happen and they can make a lot of things go away you uh, recently came out with a docu series called The Clown and the Candyman. And I watched it and it is very dark and it has a lot of twists and turns, but I thought it was an amazing job of investigative journalism. Could you tell us a little bit about The Clown and the Candyman? Well, The Clown and the Candyman, uh, it's a great title because everyone goes, oh, The Clown and the Candyman sounds like a, a fun story. It's actually the exact opposite. The Clown of the Candyman is based on two serial killers. One guy in uh, Houston called Dean Coral, the Candyman. He was called the Candyman because his mother owned a, uh, a candy store in Houston, in a, in a suburban part of Houston. And he used to work there and all the kids used to come in for candy. And in fact, he used to hand out candy. But he was a pedophile from the, from the get-go. And he recruited some teens in his neighborhood to help him to recruit boys. This is when he got to, he was around 20 at the time. He would recruit the boys in the neighborhood and they would bring boys to him and he'd give them beer and weed. Now you gotta remember this was in the seventies and beer and weed when you're a guy who's 14 is like, it's the king, you know, you can't, and he could go to his place and they could do that. Well, what would happen is after they, and they would also sniff glue. And then he would torture them. He would, he literally had a torture board in his bedroom where he would torture them, put them on. And he, some of them he kept for days. And then he eventually killed them. And him and his two cohorts, which were teenagers who were at high school, but he paid them money every time he brought them along. Uh, they would kill the kid and then they would uh, take him to a boat shed he rented and bury them in the boat shed. Um, he eventually, got caught because one of the kids, his teenage boys, um, brought a girl over one night to and he didn't like girls. Dean Coral did not like girls and he was really ticked at this guy for bringing this girl over. Uh, he ended up putting both of them on the uh, torture board and the one kid, Elmer Wayne Henley, was so upset because he was going to kill the girl, he grabbed the gun and he shot Dean Coral. That's the story. So that was the story in, and it was, he killed 26 boys, buried them in a boat shed. Some of them, he went to his, his parents' cottage uh, and he buried some of them there. But there are 26 that we know of. And he buried some of them on the beach. Just dug them, put them in the beach. And so that was 20. So that was the same time that John Wayne Gacy, way in Chicago, is picking up young boys in Chicago and murdering them and burying them in the crawl space. What we discovered is that there was one thing that kind of sort of united the two was this one guy named John David Norman. John David Norman lived in Dallas. He was from Ada, Oklahoma by birth. And he was, he was oh, I, cannot, I can't say anything other than he was a raving pedophile. He really was. I mean, he was out there. He was admitted. He loved doing it. And he he was connected to Dean Coral because 
he, Dean Carl would go to some of the same places he did uh, in Houston, in Dallas. And John David Norman ran a pedophile ring where he recruited young boys uh, and he put their pictures up in a newsletter and guys with money could read for 15 bucks. You could join, become a member for an extra three bucks. You got a catalog of all the boys. You could look at the boys and you could go, I like that guy. And for uh, a stipend for a certain amount of money, you could have the boys sent to you and you could do whatever. And, and this was, this was just a complete front for, for pedophiles and he used the young boys and he also he kept skipping so he kept getting caught because uh he kept, kept getting arrested because some of the kids parents and some of the um some of the kids themselves had no idea what they were getting into they thought they were going to have fun uh, he got arrested and he kept skipping town he went from dallas he went up to homewood Illinois. He's been in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. He kept skipping town. He kept getting arrested and he just skipped town. He ended up in Chicago and he ended up in the Cook County Jail because he was arrested. And all his arrest charges were for sodomy, all that kind of stuff, indecent liberties as they called it. And he ends up in the, in the Cook County Jail. Now, I know this is kind of a weird story, folks, but he ends up in the Cook County Jail and he meets another guy in there, a young kid, 25-year-old kid named Philip Paskey. Philip Paskey and him start up the newsletter again in the Cook County Jail. They're printing it out on the printers in the Cook County Jail. They're in there for a few months. Philip Paskey gets uh, paroled. Uh, and um, he's still in jail. Norman is still in the Cook County Jail. But eventually he does get out. And the two of them are living together in Chicago. Well, after Paskey... Uh, continues with the newsletter, he takes another job with John Wayne Gacy as one of his helpers. Because John Wayne Gacy ran a construction company. They would work on, uh, they, they dealt mostly with drug stores and those kind of pharmaceutical things. And he was, he, he helped, he, he actually lived at Gacy's house. So that's the two. And people would say, well, how do you know they're connected? Well, that's just the weirdest thing. I mean, I can't say they weren't, they were connected, but how does Philip Paskey, who's working with John Norman, and they worked together for a long time outside of jail in Chicago, then he all of a sudden he starts working for John Wayne Gacy. So that's how the two things are connected. And we know John Wayne Gacy, he, he beat out Dean Coral, the candy man in numbers, because it was, I think it was 32 boys he killed and buried them in his crawl space. So that's the two. They were very similar and they were, and John, John Norman really was, he was the pedophile kingpin of what is, the best I can say was a loosely organized pedophile ring nationwide. And the reason I say it was loose is because there was no internet, there was not, but they all had different newsletters and there were certain places they would go and everybody, everybody knew the code words in these newsletters to know where to go. So that's why he was sort of the nationwide kingpin. And he was the guy that was, he kept starting these newsletters. He kept recruiting these boys and they were boys for rent, basically. Oh, that's what it was. It was boys for rent. And to the end, to the bitter end, he was ended up in Chicago. I mean, in California, he was, he was classed as a dangerous offender. But even as a dangerous offender, when he was, <laughs> they let him out. He was like 80 years old, I think. And he was at the grocery store and he was picking up the guy, the grocery boy. He tried to pick up the grocery. So he was a really bad dude. And that's really what the show was about. But it was about how this underground pedophile network operated. And the reason why it operated and it never was exposed until Michael Sneed and Dr. Tribune outed it um, is because the government didn't do anything. I mean. The cops, and it goes back to the cops in Dallas, they found all these index cards in John Norman's apartment. Thousands with all these boys' names and their clients. They sent them to, uh, to Washington and Washington said, oh, there's nothing to do with passports here, so forget about it. And they were destroyed. Actually, they were sent to the State Department. 
State Department was sent and they were investigating it for some sort of irregularity in passports, which was, everyone kept saying, well, it had really had nothing to do with passports. I mean, some kids did end up being traveled to Europe with these sponsors, their clients, but they just disappeared and nobody would do anything. And I have document after document where people trying to get access to those and Washington and this department, they just kept saying, there's no reason to investigate, they don't exist, and they just quashed it. Now, one of the things I can tell you is, I did learn of some people who were, well, who were part of those client lists of John Norman, and they're quite famous. And I can't tell you who they are, but they are, and you would be stunned. You would be stunned. Well, actually, I've written the Franklin scandal, and I've written a lot on Jeffrey Epstein, so I wouldn't be stunned, probably. But, <laughs> um, but I think for the average person, if they see someone who really is popular on television and, and they're photogenic and they come across as like OJ Simpson was the nicest guy in America until he decapitated two people. So mm -hmm. it's amazing the front that people can put on if they've got, uh, if they're, they've got photogenicity. And well, it bothered, the other thing that was interesting, uh, Nick, is that the cops in the different cities in Urbana and in Homewood, Illinois, there was a detective, Frank Flannery. He, he was really upset by the fact that they had John Norman goods to rights and he just kept skipping town. He kept avoiding, he kept skating away and skating. And it bothered, it bothered the cops a lot. But back then you got to remember it was a different time. That's the one thing we forget. We live in a time now where we, we think, transparencies everywhere, we can find stuff out, we can go on Twitter, we can go anywhere we want and we can find what we want. Back then, you could hide a lot of stuff. And that was the shocking thing to me was, as we talked about at the very beginning, it was when I started to realize, boy, there's a lot of bad stuff that's been going on for a long time that nobody knew about. And a lot of people with a lot of money and a lot of power were at the forefront of it and they were able to quash it because they could. Do you think that that's more shocking than what we've seen with Jeffrey Epstein? That's been covered up in broad daylight right in front of us. I, I think that that might even be more shocking than what was going on in the 70s. Well, I do think, I, I do agree with you, but when I read about, uh, Jeffrey Epstein, I go, oh, he's playing from the same playbook these guys did. So that's where I'm coming from. Jeffrey Epstein didn't cook this up himself and with a bright, bright idea. These guys have been off like uh, like uh, Jerry Jerry Sandusky. Uh, you know, it's the same playbook. You know how to, he just, Jeffrey just had more money and he used, he used a lot more people with power, a lot more people with money. And that was his... Uh, that was his entree into that world. And he worked it very well, as you know, he did. Well, what's interesting, Wayne Henley, uh, the henchman who ultimately shot Dean Coral. Yeah. Um, Coral had told him that he was part of a larger pedophile network that was centered in Dallas. And that's when Norman was active. And Norman was busted shortly after Coral, which is uh, kind of interesting. Yeah, it was because he was, he was bust. The way that happened was sort of, so the Houston story breaks and it's a big story back then, 1976. All these boys that every day they're digging up more boys in the boat shed and the coverage is, is unbelievable. Like it's not like today, there's no crime scene ribbon up. The reporters are right there. They're bringing bodies out. There were, there's women in there. Some of the people from the from the police department wearing high heels are in there and they're digging up these bodies. So it was all over the news. Well, in Dallas, it was a big news story because it was in Houston. In Dallas, one kid who was at John Norman's place, he was, he was, he signed up because he thought what he innocently thought what John Norman was doing was. Uh, sponsoring young underprivileged boys to give them a leg up. So he went there and he was, he was gay, but he thought this is what they were doing. When he started going through some of uh, Norman's paperwork, he started seeing the words like kill 
um, some of the pictures. Now, if you're in the uh, news industry like we are, kill can mean just like get rid of that story, like spike it. He didn't get that. So he thought, oh my God, all these kids are being killed in Houston. Oh, and I see this. Oh, this isn't what it, what it was supposed to be. I didn't think I signed up for this. He calls the police, the police show up. And we found the one cop who was still there, who went there and found him, walked into that apartment. He said they walked in and there were some kids there. He said, it looked to me like they were ready to be shipped out. They were just in there. He said they went in there. He said, Norman didn't say a thing. He was very affable. He wasn't, he, he, he wasn't argumentative. He just sat there. He said, we went in and they found all these cards, you know, little index cards that you, your mom used to put recipes on. He oh, had no. thousands 30, of them. 30,000. Yeah. Um, and it had some of the boys, it had the voice pictures, but it had a lot of the sponsors. So they took them back to the police station. And he said he couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. He said Norman had absolutely, he didn't, it didn't bother him in the least. He said it was those cards that they kept and he gave them to his boss. So the cops give it to his boss. Now the boss, for some strange reason there, I think it was the captain, sends all the cards to Washington, to the State Department, but doesn't make copies of them. So he sends all these copies with all these clients list names on that are the pedophiles, sends them to the State Department and shazam, they disappear. And what is the State Department doing looking into a case from Texas that the feds have no part of whatsoever? Obviously, there were some very powerful people in Washington, D.C. who wanted to destroy those cards because their names on were on them and the names of other people that they knew of in that network were probably on them. There's no question about that. None whatsoever. That's what it was. Because when they, as I said earlier, one of the things, this whole thing of investigating them for passport irregularities, this had nothing to do with passports. They just wanted to get rid of it. And they did. With um, Coral, he had uh, quite a killing machine. And from your documentary, you said that 400 boys were reported missing in that particular neighborhood in, in Houston. Yeah, it was, uh, it was in, a, yeah, it was in the Heights. And it was very interesting time because you've got to remember at that time, it was the Vietnam War. So a lot of young boys would be at high school and they, they wouldn't show up because they were, they had to go to Vietnam. So when boys started to not show up and the, there would be an empty seat in the classroom, nobody really took it seriously. However, the school did, the school there did, and they warned, they sent out a, a, an email warning about um, uh, boys going missing. And they told the kids, you know, you shouldn't be talking to strangers or whatever you want. They were warning them, but it never went any further than that. And nobody really paid any attention to it. And that's one of those things, again, back in that time, you, you, you think you now and you shake your head and you go, how could this happen? One of the things that was interesting about that era is it was a blue collar area. And there's a lot of working class people there. Some of them were like single moms and, and they just didn't have the time to spend with their kids or their kids got to, you know, they were, they could do whatever they want. And a lot of kids, especially young boys, because then it was in the 70s. Remember, it was Easy Rider. Everyone was all gone to look for America. They were doing their own thing. Um, boys didn't get the attention from the police department. The other thing that's really important that I, I was stunned by, in the police department, the juvenile department, anything to do with juveniles being missing, was very different than homicide in that. They were on a different floor. And it wasn't just in Houston, it was all over America. They were separate. So if a family came and said, my boy is missing. I haven't seen him for two days. He was he went out last night and I haven't seen him. The cops would go, oh, he'll be back. Oh, he's probably gone to, he's probably gone to uh, Houston or he's probably gone to work on an oil rig or oh. they just ignored it. They just ignored it because they were boys. And even if they, they never cross paths in the department. So you could have all these missing boys in the youth division and there'd be the homicide thing over here. And they never, they never joined forces. There's a, a serial killer running around that neighborhood killing boys. And there's these 
all these missing boys and the Houston police blamed it on the parents. Yes, they did. They did. They blamed it on the parents because the parents were working. They were paying attention to their kids. They need to be, they need to take more care. I mean, that's what they did because it was, it was easy and, and they got away with it because that's what they did. And that's what used to bother me. I mean, there were some families, there was family of one boy. I mean, they put up missing person posters of their kids. In fact, Elmer Wayne Henley helped that family look to hand out posters and look for the, the kid when he was the one who lured them and knew the kid had been tortured and and murdered and buried somewhere and yet he did it and it's the astonishing um reality of what what happened in a neighborhood that was just it was your typical blue collar blue collar neighborhood there was nothing unusual about it and that's why what happened was so shocking to those people when the when the news hit that all these kids like some of them weren't in vietnam some of the kids didn't just hit on on the road to you know find their fortune these kids had been lured to dean coral's apartment where they got booze they sniffed they sniffed i forget what they called it they called it huffing or something then and then they were tortured now some of these boys too he had the torture board which was like a piece of plywood and you they were hooked up like this and he would keep a cut some of them for days and he tortured them so badly that they begged to be killed they begged to be killed and uh you know it i know i talk about this so flippantly it, it may seem but it does get to you after a while and i i know you're not supposed to you know you're supposed to be objective about this but uh, when I talk to the families of those kids, I, you know, I go back there and I, I still get teary eyed and I, I, I don't say that I just can't imagine how it happened, but it, it did. And, and he was so normal to everybody liked them because he was a nice guy. He was friendly. His mother had candy store. He was, he worked at the, the local uh, electric company. He was a lineman. You know, he was, and he used, the, he used the cord from the electric company to strangle these kids. I mean, it was, it was beyond belief the horrors he did. In fact, I can't even tell you some of the things that he did to some of those boys because it's, it's not worth knowing. It's what amazes me about that is these guys are absolute monsters, but they can appear very normal. And yeah. when they're walking around, you, I mean, you can look at one in the shopping center, you can look at one walking down the sidewalk and they will appear normal. You can strike up a conversation with them. They will appear normal. Absolutely. But, but they inside, will. they are monsters. They are monsters. And, you know, you wonder, you know, that's the big $64,000 question or whatever that is in inflationary terms now. Uh, that's why we like true crime in a way in serial killers, because most of us look at them and go, is there something I'm missing? Does this guy have a weird hairdo or is they got a carbuncle at the back of their neck that says, oh, yeah, you're sick because they don't present. And the thing is, when you're these guys also know that what they like to do is. Is not what the rest of the public is. So they go, oh, I've got to hide that fact. I mean, they're smart enough to know how to compartmentalize and go, oh, yes, I've got to pretend now to care because they don't really. But that's how that's how they operate. And when you get away with it for so long, you know, then they get even more emboldened. Well, they blend into society so well. I mean, there's a few exceptions like Richard Ramirez, if you wanted to. Uh serial killer from central casting you would just call down for richard ramirez but most of them just blend into society they do so norman is busted in dallas he's got thirty thousand index cards uh he's showing that show that he is flying kids all around the country and getting money for him and um he's a, a lifelong predator the first time he was arrested for molesting mm -hmm. child was 1954 yep and then he posts bond. He's in jail for about a month and he posts bond and then he just splits and goes to Illinois with a new name and immediately fires up his pedophile network. 
right? Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think he he left, uh, and then the Dallas police did nothing because yes. he just came down. And I think he changed the name to Steve Gerwell, I think is what he changed his name to. And he starts up another newsletter. I mean, the one in Dallas was called, jeez, uh, I forget. They had, he had so many. He had the Delta Project. He had uh, Epic International. He had uh, the list of newsletters that he had he just would start up new, new all the time. Now he was, uh, he was quite ticked when he got caught in Dallas, Nick. When the cops caught him. They took away all his cards, so he had to start again, and that kind of bugged him, because those recipe cards or those index cards, that was his client list, and that's how he operated back then. There was no internet. Now around 1985 or something, he started to move into the, into a computer. To put it on a computer but before that he just kept starting up a new a new list and he was very good at it because he was also very friendly he was affable and he would go to places where kids would go and offer them say come on back to my place i've got beer i've got corn you know 13 14 year old boys they were, they were there and he'd give them beer and then he would have sex with them, oral sex with them. They were all drunk and they'd been watching the porn. And then they were so ashamed. I mean, that's the other part. A lot of these boys, you know, their sex drive says, oh my God, you know, I'm drunk, I'm doing weed and I'm watching porn and I'm like 14. This is like, well, but they're, once that's, they're out, they, get, they wake up, they realize they can't tell anybody. You know, there's that whole factor because back then too, you got to hide it. You're not going to tell your mother. Hey, guess what I did today, mom? And that was what he would do. He would prey on these young boys. And some of them uh, were runaways because the other thing too is the runaway boys a lot of times then too were, were gay and they ran away to us because they were gay and nobody would accept them in the, in the, in the places they, they lived. They would run away and then they needed money. And so John Norman would offer them money to be one of these kids who could be sent out be rented out to their their clients and it was and they could stay at his place while they were there uh and they got money and they got nice clothing and they got to go to places what some of them went to europe and oh, it, was, it was it was great but that's what they were doing they were trading their sex for you know just a place to live and a place you know to to get by Norman was busted in Dallas, Chicago, Houston, Sacramento, Santa Ana, Los Angeles, and Stanford. Yeah. Um, so here is Pennsylvania too. Gettysburg is also Pennsylvania and Gettysburg too. Like he was he was everywhere, man. <laughs> and no one decided to keep him in prison for a protracted period of time. Not one of those after this unbelievable record of running a pedophile network for years. And, and offenses against children going back um, to 1954, he just kept on getting let out of prison. That's, that's kind of mind boggling. Yeah, it is. And that's, that's the conundrum of, of the story of John David Norman. He got away with it for so long and he had no, even when he was in prison, he was writing letters and he write, he'd write fabulous letters. You know, because he he saw himself as he said he used to do TV commercials in his earlier days. I, I really don't know how much he did, but he was a very affable, friendly guy. And he knew how to walk the walk and talk the talk. And he would he when he was in prison, it was like he wasn't. It was just like he was, I don't know, on vacation or something. He, he didn't bother him. He just kept on going. No problem. No problem whatsoever. And he got he got away with it to his dying day. I mean, even when he was, you know, he was trying to get parole, he was trying to get off the serious offender or whatever they call it in California. And he, he just couldn't understand why he was being, he knew what, he knew it was against the law. He knew what he did was wrong, but he didn't understand why it was wrong because he couldn't help himself. He was, when I look at all the things he's done, he was, he molested so many boys and had sex with so many young boys across America. It's astonishing. And he talks about it. I mean, I, there was things that we had, we found letters where he would write to boys and talk about, you know, how he'd have sex with these, and these boys, like on and on and on. He was insatiable. And so that's when he realized, no, he, he realized quite young, he was, 
he was a pedophile. And he decided, why don't I turn my proclivity into a business? And that's what he did. And uh, he also made uh, copious amounts of child pornography. And from what I understand, he was connected to some foster care families um, who were just straight up pedophiles. And they got these foster kids to loan out to Norman. And I saw that in the Franklin scandal, there was a foster uh, care house. Actually, they had there was uh, they had adopted four kids, and I believe they had four foster kids, and so there were eight kids, and they were farming out one of the girls, and there was so much evidence against them as far as child abuse, as as far as physical abuse. They were starving the kids. Uh, they were molesting the kids, and as I said, they were farming one of them out at that point, the oldest one out, and uh, nothing ever happened to them for that. Um, yeah. That's was, well. Remember back then too, because when did the Franklin scandal happen? That was in. It was in the eighties. Yeah, because remember, you know, back then, um, if you were a pedophile, you go, "Where are the boys?" And so, like Big Brothers was a perfect place to go. Fostering was was like ground zero. It was ground zero. You could be a guy, you know, a lawyer or whatever. You could be anybody. And if you were a pedophile, you could say, I want to foster. And you could do it. And that was, and, and also, you, you know, you, you got money for it. So it was a fabulous way for a pedophile to get access to young boys on the legit. And they did it. And it was, that's why Big Brothers Today is, I don't even know if it exists. But I know, and the other thing too is, uh, some of these pedophiles were were in the were in law enforcement because youth protection was another great cover. You could be in youth protection, and they're taking care of these young kids, and they were there for the picking, and that happened a lot too. You know, they started Troop One Three Seven, uh, and and it went on for about a year. This was 1976, and it was started by uh, three guys. Uh, John Halvardson and a guy called Raymond uh, Woodall. And there was another guy. Well, here's how it, but here's how it got busted. It would never have got busted. No one would ever have known about it had it not been for a breakdown at a photo mat machine. You remember, I don't know if you remember, but years ago, you used to be able to take your, these little photo mat things. You'd take your photos and you'd put them in there. And a couple of days later, you'd come and pick them up. Well, there was a photo mat machine broke down in Dallas. It broke down and the guy who ran the photo map machine said, well, I thought he was trying to figure out well, what's wrong. And as he's trying to figure out what's wrong with the photo map, he notices the photos that are on, on the, that are bust, that are stuck in there. And it's two boys having sex with these two other guys. Like it's, it's pornographic. So he calls up the cops and he said, uh, he said, there's something going on here. And I think you better see it because he saw the name of the guy who, who had sent in the pictures was a guy by the name of Harry Kramer and he was from New Orleans. Well, they sent it to these two cops and there was two cops who worked for the Noir in New Orleans. Their, name, their names are Gus Stansbury and Frank Weeks. Now Gus Stansbury and Frank Weeks were just your average young guys called detectives. And to, to, to this day, they are my heroes. So they get these pictures and they've got them up on their board and they're looking at it and they're going, how can we figure out who these guys are? How can we figure out who these guys are? And they have them up for a couple of days. And finally, their boss walks by and he goes, oh, there's a Boy's Life magazine on the coffee table beside the couch where the kids are. He said, that's a Boy Scout. Boy's Life magazine is, is the Boy Scout magazine. So they went over to the Boy Scout troop and they said, uh, the guy said, oh, yeah, well, Troop, that's, yeah, that, yeah, Harry Kramer, he belongs to Troop 137, but it's, it's over. We, we got rid of that. That's disbanded. And they were, they said, well, we'd like some more information. And he came out about, he came out and gave one piece of, he gave him one piece of paper like this. He came out, and the, the secretary handed him a piece of paper. And it was blank. It just said Troop 137 disbanded. Nothing. So they went to the regional office. They sat there for 45 minutes and the secretary finally said, you know what, he's not coming back. 
So that bugged these two dudes, <laughs> these two detectives. So they started searching and they finally tracked down Harry Kramer and they finally got warrants. And what they discovered is they exposed this Troop 137. They exposed that this was a front. These guys were running a pedophile network. Even worse, the two guys who were running it, Richard Halverson and Raymond Woodall, who Raymond Woodall is a very devious guy, used to work in Coral Gables. Now, I know folks, you're not going to believe this. I know it sounds weird, but it's true. Worked in Coral Gables at a private boys school called the Adelphi Academy. And they worked as maintenance men. Well, at the Adelphi Academy, there was, it was a front for for, for renting out boys. They were, they were prostituting boys out of there. They were bringing boys from New Orleans and, and all over, telling the family, the single parent mom, we're going to give your boy a head, heads up. Oh, well, it's going to be great. He's going to get an education he would never get. They get to that school and they're farmed out. But they were the ones that were the, uh, the troop master and the assistant troop master of Troop 137. And they used that to recruit boys. Well, these two cops were so diligent they would not give up, and they fought when they they finally forced uh, the DA to give them search warrants to go and search Richard Halverson's house, Raymond Woodall's house. And when they got in there, he said, "Jackie, we found a treasure trove of stuff." He said, "Unbelievable amounts of pornography." and stuff for pedophiles. And he said, uh, this is the one thing that always sticks out in my mind. He said, the one thing about pedophiles is they're hoarders. He said, and they kept everything that had to do with each one of those boys. It wasn't just that they were, it wasn't like a, a hooker who does a transaction and then forgets about it. These guys kept all these files on these boys. In fact, he said, now I'm gonna say something that's, it was in the show, so I know that the public's heard this before. He said, what we found in, the, in their rooms is going through the files is we found they used to keep urine samples of each little boy because that was special to them. I mean, that is how their head worked, what, what excited them. And that's what they found in that room. Eventually, they were charged, they were, they were arrested, and... Gus Stansbury and Frank Weeks got, uh, managed to arrest 10 others. It's a total of 10 others that were arrested and charged. And see, these were some of the men who had rented the boys. And they were quite rich people. One of them was a former part owner of the New England Patriots. Uh, they were rich dudes. One guy was a, a millionaire guy from San Francisco, and he would bring the kids out to his private boat. It was huge. They got... Mellers, who was a millionaire and industrialist. And yeah, yeah, yeah. His name was, uh, yeah, Mellers was, I think. There was a bunch of them. Richard Jacobs was the former owner of the, or part owner of the New England Patriots. Yeah, and did he, was not, was he also, did he own Jet Spray? I think he owned Jet Spray at the time, too. I'm not I think sure. he did that. Town. But there, yeah, those, those were, and they were charged and arrested, but uh, Raymond Woodall, and Halverson, they, they, they did go to prison. They did go to jail, but a lot of the other guys skated. They put up bond and disappeared. Uh, the one guy that ran the school in Coral Gables, California, I think his name was Peter Bradford. Um, he was charged in that, but he posted bond and he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't leave Florida. They, they tried to get him to New Orleans, he wouldn't leave. So, you know, these guys all skated, but these two cops did manage to get bring attention to the pedophile ring troop 137 out of new orleans and it was big a big news story i mean it hit the new york times it was a big story but no when i when we did this story people were stunned and i, I said well it was out there but the boy scouts managed to quell it because it wasn't part of their image they didn't want and they got they were they managed to quell it and in fact the da at the time who was the uh, DA at the time was uh, uh, Harry Connick's father was the DA at the time. And he prosecuted them. And I, he's, he's quite old right now. And he said, he's 95. And he said, if I live to be 105, I'll never forget that case. But there were things in that case that the prosecutor's office in New Orleans didn't go after. 
and there's still a lot of untold stories there that where people got away with uh, a lot of pedophiles got away with stuff because they were connected and they were famous not famous but they were well known and they had they had some clout in the community and they got away with it but, but that's another big story troop 137 was nothing more than a front for a pedophile ring with uh, John Wayne Gacy and Dean Coral, we have circumstantial evidence linking them to John Norman. But actually, the guys who started Troop 137, uh, Woodall, uh, Raymond Woodall, he actually was in contact with John Norman. I love that part. So yeah, I love that. They, they were in contact. I mean, this is two very large pedophile networks that are in contact with one another. In fact, John Norman's, uh, Raymond Woodall's contact information was in John Norman's contact information because that's how they would connect because, oh, there's a bunch of guys, do, oh, well, maybe they want some of my clients because they were running that Boys for Rent scheme. I mean, that's how they operated and they did find his name in... Uh, John Norman's name in Raymond Woodall's address book. And in fact, the two cops, they tried their best researching it to, for me to find that. Of course, of course, that disappeared too. But I remember um, uh, Michael Sneed of New York, of the Chicago Tribune, she said, yeah, I know that's, that's another thing we tried to drill down on. And she said, it, it did exist, but, it, but finding the copy, people talked about it, it was there, but then actually finding the, the, uh, the address book, nobody could find. But they were, this is what I said earlier. People didn't have regular meetings like so-and-so, John Wayne Gacy, present here, you know, Dean Grubb, present, they didn't. It was this nebulous underground web. And when it's a web, there's these little thin tentacles. And that's how they, that's how they operate. It was loosely organized, but it was organized because they didn't want to be too in the radar but they operated freely and they operated, uh, they flourished for many years. Pretty much they operated with impunity. Yes. What we're seeing is uh, these pedophiles, a number of them have been with the Boy Scouts. I mean, the Boy Scouts knew um, and actually protected pedophiles for a number of years. You were talking about big brothers. There was a bank robber named Willie Sutton. He was a famous bank robber, I believe in the 50s, 60s. And he was asked, Willie, why do you rob banks? And he said, well, that's where the money is. And that's why these guys are gonna be attracted to jobs like that because that's where the children are. I mean, these pedophile, you're absolutely right, Nick. These pedophile networks, they had these newsletters and what the cops, uh, what Gus Stansbury and Frank Weeks, the detectives out of New Orleans told me is, they had in their in their brochures how to and he even compared it to he they compared it to a terrorist cell he said the violence wasn't there he said but they operated in these little clusters and they could be uh they could be ignited when needed and he said they had they had it done how to approach a boy what to do there was a whole how to do stuff and it was very Everybody had it, everybody knew it, and they gave lessons on how you approach boys, this is how you get them. You go to mothers who, in fact, one, Richard Halverson, what he would do is, uh, and, and a lot of the other guys do, is they would approach women who were single moms and they would pretend to like them, but they really were only interested in their son. So they would do that. That's another way to get at it, to pretend you're, you know, you want to date the mother, but it's really the kid you were after. They, they had no, they thought this through. It was well thought through because they, the thing with pedophiles is they don't get why we don't get what they like. <laughs> and that's why I don't know how it's now it's just the dark web or whatever, but it's the same thing. They just don't understand why we don't accept boy love as they call it. What's interesting to me is I've been in this world for 20 years or so. I started researching the Franklin scandal 20 years ago. And what happened with these networks that we're talking about, the various incarnations of Norman's network and also uh, 
the pseudo of Scout Troop 137, all that information is gone. It's completely gone on, on all the, uh, the clients who a lot of them were power brokers, all of it's gone. And that's what amazes me about the Franklin scandal and also about Epstein and the finders and also the keepers, these networks that I've had shows about is only one of those networks has anybody really been accountable. And that was the Epstein network. And that was just Epstein and Maxwell. They, they were the, the only ones that, I could, and we know about scores of pedophiles that were affiliated with those networks. And it just breaks my heart to mm -hmm. see that our society is, I mean, we might have technology that's advanced, but our society is still letting this uh, go on en masse. Well, you know, it's very interesting you say that because I used to ask the, the cops that a lot. Right? And they said, well, back then, they said, well, we knew it was going on, but the public really didn't want to know about it. They knew it was there, but nobody wanted to talk about it. So they just let it be. And that's what happened. The cops knew about this, but nobody really wanted to prosecute and nobody really wanted to talk about it. So they just, until it got really dangerous, but they just let it, let it happen. And then they were, they were overruled a lot of times by lawyers, prosecutors, government officials, bureaucrats. You know, that's what I keep saying. Money and power can make a lot of things go away if you're in the right position. And look at Jeffrey Epstein, you know, he, he you know, money and power made him, he got where he was. He, he got to where he wanted to be and he got away with it, really. He didn't pay for his crimes, really. I don't know. Some people might say he did, but I don't know. What I've seen with these networks is there's a continuum with the pedophiles about what they're into. And some of them are actually into really violent actions towards children. And in the Franklin scandal, we have, there's a couple of examples of kids who say that they witnessed um, murder. And with the Epstein network, I have it from a very good source that, um, a former prime minister of a country was into beating up these girls. I mean, beating them up. I mean, he's a former prime minister of a country. And so I think that there's a continuum with, and, and it's, I think it's somewhat analogous to like drug addiction, where some people just stop smoking pot and, um, you know, some people try Coke a couple of times. Very seldom do people that smoke marijuana or or drink beer for that matter, end up as heroin addicts or crack addicts. Mm -hmm. But there's a, there's a progression in each drug that they use. They, they keep wanting more and more and more. And I think that that same dynamic might be at work with pedophiles, that they start being violent to children and they enjoy it. And then, and then they get more violent and then they get more violent. Uh, right. I think you're right about that. I, I mean, I'm, I'm working on a, a, a new project now and that that is that is what seems to be it, it, doing one thing isn't enough they try it like actually sometimes people uh, sometimes people murder and they don't mean that serial killers murder they accidentally go too far i mean they say that's what happened with gacy they, he accidentally went too far and after he did it he went oh, i don't really feel that badly <laughs> and so they want to do it again and so that's what happens it's it becomes insatiable and you need more and more and more to get that kind of high or that, uh, that feeling that they're, they're after. And, and I think you're right on that. That's the scary part of it. With uh, Epstein, he had an addiction that just kept escalating for young girls. He was having quote unquote massages three times a day. So that's where his escalation was. But I think that there's uh, these pedophiles are, all along the continuum. Um, and once they start enjoying hurting children, then it just really can escalate from there. And I think that you might end up with a John Wayne Gacy or, or Dean Coral, um, mm -hmm. who had started out as pedophiles, as heinous as that is, but then 
they just uh, because both of them were uh, into torture, and um, I mean that's what really got them off was was the torture of of children, mm -hmm. and I think that that is unfortunately a reality for these guys is that they start and then that and then it just escalates. And the thing is, we try to figure out a way to solve it, and we still don't know. Uh, why it happens, why they do it, why why we continue to let it happen, or we just are helpless because nobody really has an answer. It's you, you bring it to light and you want to make it heinous, but there's a lot of people who think, well, you know, sex before eight, before it's too late. I mean, that's how some of these people think, and you're never going to change those people. I that's one thing I've learned. That's the one depressing thing. I mean, I like doing these stories because. But it, just like you, you want to bring it to life so people are shocked and they want change. But I don't know about these people. They seem to not want to change. And I don't know the answer to that. I was very perplexed about this reality uh, when I was investigating the Franklin scandal. And I talked to a psychologist who is in Washington, D.C., who works with, uh, with sex offenders and... Uh, and she told me that the vast majority will never change. And, and to change requires a tremendous amount of vigilance. And because at that point, it, it is an addiction to them. And, it, and it's very, very difficult. Once, once you have an addiction like that, it's, it's very, very difficult to stop it. With what we're dealing with now with the Epstein case, when I had finished writing the Franklin scandal, I had really thought if this, something like this ever blows up again with the internet, we're gonna be able to hold perpetrators responsible. And, and that has not happened. The media has hugely let us down. I mean, the government has let us down, but the government has let us down repeatedly in this area. But the media is tr just as guilty as malfeasance as the government. I mean, the media could have really pushed this story and these poor girls could have received justice. But that is not the case here. Yeah, you're right. It, it, I mean, I don't I don't know if he if he would have if the story would have even got the attention it did if it hadn't been for the uh, the one woman who just never let it lie. Uh, you know, she's the one person. I mean, sometimes. Sometimes all it takes is one person and, and they, you know, they become the, the scapegoat or the, the spokesman for so many, because some of the kids I talked to, and we did talk to some of them, their big thing is shame. And shame is a great motivator to not say anything. And it's to this day, you know, there, there's a lot of shame. They just didn't want to talk about it, but that's how these guys get away with it. And uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, Epstein, well, he can make, you know, as I say, money and power can make a lot of things go away. And he did. And he got away with it. And who knows who's still out there carrying on, carrying the torch, keeping it going. There's no question in my mind. It's this is brought it to light. So we're more, we're more aware of it now. But that doesn't mean less of it's going on. We know who a lot of the pedophiles are in Jeffrey Epstein's network. And the thing about it is, just because Jeffrey Epstein's dead, they are not going to stop. And probably as I speak right now, one of those pedophiles in that very large nationwide network is probably molesting a child or preparing, thinking about molesting a child. And for some reason, the media just wanted to give us salacious dirt instead of justice. And I think that they were taking their cue from the government. But I really, given that I put all these years into investigating networks like this, I was, I was pretty heartbroken um, that the media, and I don't think it's over yet, but just to see the media take this so uh, not seriously, it was, it, it troubled me. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I agree. 
it, it's, it is troubling because it was a salacious story. It was like, oh, rich guy. Oh, and then, oh, and then he killed himself in, in prison. Oh, did he kill himself? And it's all that kind of stuff. But the root of it is that there are guys out there preying on young, young people. And they're still out there preying on. They're just, they've just gone. They're hiding it more. They've gone undercover. And we haven't discovered it yet. And part of the thing is we just don't know how. I mean, how do you do how do you, that's the thing that, that bothers me. If the young people won't talk about it because they're ashamed or whatever, the people doing it obviously don't want to get caught. I mean, that's the conundrum. That's the conundrum we're in. And in fact, a lot of today, they, they're trying to normalize it. So we go, oh, well, that's the way it is. But I don't know. I don't know the answer. That's the depressing part of of this you want to do these stories so you bring light to something so we move forward and we change we go that was then this is now now we know all this now but what are we doing about it and to your point i don't think the media has done that part of the story or cares to truly unfortunate you know what i'll just have to add it's a lot of work doing that the, the clown and the candy man nick there was it was a lot of work just going through files, trying to get access. Oh, it doesn't exist. FOIA stuff. You get FOIA back and it's a, you get a FOIA document back and it's like this. And you go, <laughs> it's so frustrating. I used to, I used to want to cry sometimes. I was so frustrated, you know? I too have experienced that myself. I've received FOIAs that, uh, this is kind of interesting and I've mentioned it on the show before, but I read in the New York Times that the Epstein case was closed. So if the New York Times says it, it's got to be true. Mm -hmm. And I FOIA'd um, the, the FBI and Department of Justice. And I asked them, I didn't ask them because there were a number of DVDs, hundreds, maybe thousands. We don't really know exactly that were taken out of Epstein's safe um, by the FBI. And since the New York Times said that the case was closed. I FOIA'd the FBI and Department of Justice requesting, I didn't want the DVDs, but I wanted the reports that went along with the DVDs. And then I was told that it was an ongoing case. <laughs> so. Uh, that old chestnut. <laughs> it's an ongoing investigation. Yes. Sorry, you can't talk about it. How many times have we heard that one? <laughs> and no, on one last rule. America has this uh, fixation with serial killers. I, I think that we probably manufacture, our society probably manufactures more serial killers than any other society. I wrote a big article on serial killers once and um, I was living in Minneapolis at the time. I wrote it for the Alternative Weekly in Minneapolis and over a 10 year period, like, I think it was close to 50 women, mostly prostitutes, have been stabbed, strangled, or uh, beaten to death. And I got the list. It was, uh, it was a lot of work, a lot of legwork, and I got the list, and I went to the Minneapolis Police Department, I went to the St. Paul Police Department, and I had this list, and I said, Are you, uh, do you guys, and they completely had previously completely denied that there was a serial killer. And I said, you still want to keep up with this story after this list? And th they gave in. And ultimately, a task force was formed. But the uh, uh, perpetrator or perpetrators were never found. And but one thing I noticed writing this, and I did a lot of research on serial killers, America has a fascination with serial killers. Um, do, do you have any, do you want to take a guess on it or? Well, we do because it's so not what we are, you know, it's so we don't kill, we don't kill other people. And, and if we do, it's usually it's an accident. Somebody's drunk and they go, go too far, but I mean, everything, our whole, our whole morality is based on do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And, you know, we have community and we respect each other's space and stuff like that. And then someone comes along and thinks nothing about killing not one person, but multiple people and carrying on in life. I don't know. I mean, the thing that, that separates me from the serial killer is I would feel really guilty. <laughs> I mean, if the cops came, I'd be, yeah, I did it. I'm sorry, but they don't. And that's why we are fascinated. Like 
Who are these people? Where did they come from? Is there something in their DNA? Is it something in the way they were brought up? What is it that makes them do it? But still no one really knows for sure. And we worry times, is it someone I know? You know, because it's what you think, you know, because like, how many times you hear the story goes, I never thought that guy was a really nice guy. And then you go, well, yeah, and, and you killed a lot of people. And you wonder, do I know a serial killer? Like, how can I tell if they are? And you want to look for one. So you're smart and you'll go, ah, there's one. And you want to call the police and say, there's a serial killer there, but we don't know. That's the fascination I think we have with them because it's so killing another human being is, is the worst deed we can do. And they do it multiple times and don't care about it. The United States seems to excel in serial killing. Although the Russians have some pretty bad ones. They're always chopping people up and frying them or whatever. <laughs> Germany has a couple of bad ones. <laughs> I mean, there are serial killers that have been exposed in Europe, but uh, but in the United States, we keep producing them. And I don't know what it is about this society that uh, produces more ser serial killers. And I, I saw this, I couldn't believe it, but um, I was told that there's actually like, you've got baseball gum cards um, or, or baseball, baseball cards um, with the gum. There's actually serial killer cards now. And mm -hmm. I, was, I was saying to myself, wow, um, that's really, really disturbing. Well, maybe, we could, maybe there's so many serial killers or there are, I mean, I don't know, but it's a vast country um people people don't think first of all people don't think someone's a serial killer it's the you don't really till you hear it in the news so you're not you're not looking out for that it's not number one on your on your on your list you're not looking at that the other thing too is uh you know the way law enforcement was set up you could get away with murder because every police department was, has its own little patch and until CODIS came where they were transferring information you really could do whatever you want and just disappear and, and no one would notice you and then remember there was no DNA DNA has put a, I believe has put a uh, has put a little bit of a pin in the serial killers world because you have to be pretty good now at covering every little track because of DNA and in fact that's what's happening now a lot of the stories you see in the news are you know 40 year old case finally solved by DA you know people who got away with stuff so I mean I don't know if there's more serial killers in America than anywhere else I don't know they seem to they seem to be a lot of them but I don't know if there's any you know there might be more Britain's got some pretty bad dudes I mean they had you know well, but they do exist in society boring. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know, yeah, exactly. But there was a there was a they say the 70s was the uh, was the golden age of serial killers. And I don't really know what that means. Just that they discovered a lot of them back then or I don't know. Maybe it's because we were freer, where there was nobody cared about anything. I go back to that. We're all on the we're going on the road. It was the hippie movement, you know, free love, free everything. And it was kind of like, do whatever you want. And within that venue, you might be able to uh, live as a serial killer, as long as you hit it well. Jackie, I want to thank you so much for making The Clown and the Candy Man. As I said earlier in the show, it's an amazing piece of investigative journalism. The way that you were able to tie those two very large pedophile networks together. And once again, we see that when these pedophile networks lead to very, very powerful men, the crimes get quashed. And I'm really hoping that our society can get beyond that. Um, do you have any closing thoughts on the clown and the candy man? Well, the problem with the clown and the candy man is I could have kept going. I could have kept looking and covering more and more and more, but you know, you have deadlines and you have to get it done. 
so it's it's never ending. We also did a, I also did a podcast, sort of a larger podcast on that as well, and that's still available wherever you get your podcasts. It's called The Clown and the Candyman, and it goes into a little more detail where we talk to some victims. And um, I just wish that I could find an answer so I could phone up law enforcement and say I finally figured out how to how to profile or figure out who the serial killer is before he kills too many. That's why I keep doing true crime, but that's, that's why you do it. You want people to know about what really is going on beneath what you really, what you think is going on, because what you think is going on is only half is only one quarter of what's really going on beneath the surface. And, 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 and that's where evil lives. As Oscar Wilde said, go below the surface at your own risk. That's right. And I found that to be true. And you've also found that to be true. Well, The Clown and the Candyman is an amazing uh, docuseries. And uh, the, as I said earlier, the investigation is, is pretty, uh, pretty breathtaking. And uh, I just want to thank you for coming on the Nick Bryan podcast. Well, I, I'm very, I hope I didn't bum too many people out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I doubt that that's the case on this podcast. Okay, well, thank you. And if you know, if people want to watch the series, they can. It's on, I believe, it's on Discovery Plus and on Amazon. Okay, great. Have a great day, Jackie. Yeah, you too. And uh, take care. <laughs>